Alfred Wallace was born in 1855 in Devonport, near Plymouth, but spent most of his life in Cornwall. After going to sea as a cabin boy at the age of nine, Wallace spent his early life working on lugger and deep-sea fishing boats off the Cornish coast and in the Atlantic. He later set up a marine scrap store in St Ives. Wallace didn't begin making art until around the age of 70, following the death of his wife. He said that he turned to painting for company to stave off loneliness. Jim Ede, the creator of Kettle's Yard, was introduced to Wallace through their mutual friend, the artist Ben Nicholson. Wallace sent bundles of works to Ede so that he could select the paintings he wished to buy. Although Ede and Wallace never met in person, they corresponded for almost a decade, and the collection at Kettle's Yard was built upon their close friendship. It now contains over 100 works by Wallace, the largest holding in the world, and the majority of which are displayed here. This exhibition, Alfred Wallace Rediscovered, seeks to reappraise Wallace's central contribution to the development of modern art in Britain by exploring his innovative style, subject matter and use of unconventional materials. It also features three rarely seen and extraordinary sketchbooks that the artist made in the final year of his life. Wallace intended each work he made to conjure up a direct experience for the viewer. It is perhaps in this creative desire to capture the truth of lived experiences that his artistic innovation can be most clearly felt. As Ben Nicholson wrote to Jim Ede on the day of Wallace's death in 1942, I don't think a good Wallace is representational, it is simply real. The exhibition begins in the year 1928. That summer, the British artists Ben Nicholson and Christopher Wood were holidaying in St Ives in Cornwall when they encountered Wallace painting in his house. He was surrounded by artworks that he'd pinned to the walls with large nails, which you can still see in works like this one. The following year, Nicholson arranged for Wallace's works to be included in an avant-garde group exhibition organised by the Seven and Five Society in London. He also introduced Jim Ede to Wallace's work. Ede quickly purchased his first Wallace and a lively letter correspondence with the artist ensued, lasting until 1939. You can see some of the letters in this gallery. This section includes three works by Nicholson and Wood, all made in the year 1928. You can see the immediate influence of Wallace's work in their choice of unconventional materials, like this unframed wooden board that Christopher Wood uses, and a pared down colour palette and flattened perspective, seen in this painting of a Cornish port by Ben Nicholson. This part of the exhibition examines Wallace's artistic technique and style. One thing that made Wallace's work so distinctive and appealing was his use of unconventional materials. Working with boat or household paints, he would recycle pieces of cardboard, often from the local greengrocer, allowing the irregular shapes to dictate the composition and leaving areas bare to reveal the colour and texture of the cardboard. Occasionally, Wallace would also paint onto everyday items, like this earthenware jug. He worked in a limited colour palette, a deliberate choice that he explained in a letter to Jim Ede, writing that he didn't like to put colours where they don't belong. In spite of this, Wallace was able to manipulate his materials to achieve a variety of expressive effects. In works like this one, he uses thick layers of paint to convey the churning waves of the stormy sea. In others, Wallace uses delicate line drawings to illustrate ships and boats with an almost diagrammatic accuracy. Moving into the next section, we begin to look at how Wallace captures a sense of movement. Describing Wallace's work in 1945, Jim Ede wrote, In picture after picture, Wallace conveys the varied movement of a ship the sea feeling, the ship feeling, the land in the distance, the pitching and tossing and the passing of lighthouses and other ships, the smell of ropes and the vastness of sky. In works like this one, we see a motor vessel tossed around on the sea, a large wave rising before it and threatening to engulf it entirely. Elsewhere, Wallace conveys the swift movement of boats slicing through the water, their sails inflated with wind or steam streaming backwards from their funnels. Wallace also drew on his own experiences as a sailor and fisherman. In this painting, he captures the hive of activity on board, with fishermen hauling in their nets while seagulls and rain clouds swirl in the sky above. This section takes a closer look at Wallace's favourite subject, ships and boats. As well as providing respite from the loneliness he felt after the death of his wife, Wallace used painting as a nostalgic outlet, portraying his memories of the sea and his love for the ships and boats of the past. Many of his works depict places and scenes from an earlier era, featuring the types of people and vessels he would have encountered during his long career at sea and in St Ives. Brigantines and barks with magnificent sails and figureheads are illustrated in meticulous detail, conjuring the relics of a lost age. Wallace had direct experience of sailing on these larger vessels, working as a merchant sailor and undertaking Atlantic voyages as a young man. In other works, Wallace again draws on his experience as a fisherman, 
This small painting shows the Flying Scud, a lugger that he'd once worked on fishing for herring and mackerel around the coast of Britain. Sometimes the old and the new collide, with traditional sailing ships depicted alongside modern steam motor vessels, and even airships, which Wallace would have seen patrolling the Cornish coastline during the First World War. The final section in this gallery explores Wallace's approach to places and landscapes. Wallace's paintings evoke a unique sense of place, although it's unlikely that he ever worked directly on his sketches or paintings outdoors. Recognisable geographical features like ports and harbours are condensed and abstracted to emphasise certain elements or simply to fit the unusual shapes of his salvaged materials. This painting shows the south coast of Cornwall, with landmarks including the Lizard Lighthouse, Falmouth, St Anthony Lighthouse and St Michael's Mount all crammed into the frame. Perspective is often deliberately distorted, shifting between conventional landscapes, map-like aerial views and even underwater scenes, sometimes all combined within a single painting. There's a sense of being surrounded by the landscape from all angles. This absence of a fixed perspective is often attributed to Wallace's lack of formal artistic training, although works like this one show he was capable of convincingly portraying scale and distance when he wanted to. Instead, Wallace's paintings go beyond the simple documentation of the appearance of things. Painting from memory, he captured the essence and feeling of places he'd experienced, from the familiar landmarks of the Cornish coastline to the sensation of being out on the open sea or dwarfed by a forest of tall trees. Moving into the second gallery, we look at some of the works Wallace produced later in his career. Wallace didn't provide dates or titles for his works, which makes constructing a chronology of his artistic development challenging. However, clues can sometimes be found in the paintings themselves. Some later works, like this one, are more comprehensively worked on, with greater care taken to build up complex scenes and to layer the paint. These works are unusual in that they can be dated more accurately. This is because they depict a real-life event, the wreck of the Panamanian steamer, the Alba, in St Ives in 1938, which Wallace would have witnessed. Wallace also produced a number of late works on black card with white crayon, referred to by biographer Sven Berlin as the death paintings, referencing their sombre palettes and the fact that they were made at the end of Wallace's life. At the centre of this gallery, there are three artist sketchbooks made by Wallace in the final year of his life. In the summer of 1941, Wallace's friend, the art critic Adrian Stokes, arranged for him to be cared for at the Madron Institute near Penzance, owing to the artist's deteriorating health. Wallace's only access to artist materials came through Stokes, Ben Nicholson and Margaret Mellis. They supplied him with sketchbooks and pencils, unusually brightly coloured crayons and enamel paints, which he requested in a more familiar palette of green, black and white. Many of the pages of the sketchbooks are signed, suggesting that Wallace considered them as finished individual works. Throughout the books, we can identify some of the artist's favourite subjects, executed in contrasting techniques using thickly layered paint or delicate line work. Familiar subjects include the Royal Albert Bridge in Devonport, St Ives Harbour and its lighthouse, three-masted ships and steamers with smoke billowing, and houses engulfed by trees. All of these subjects can be seen in paintings displayed in this gallery. Some pages in the sketchbooks suggest a narrative sequence. For example, these pages appear to depict the story of Noah's Ark, a boat perched upon Mount Ararat, followed perhaps by a congregation giving thanks after their survival of the flood. Wallace was a devout Christian who read the Bible every day and didn't paint on Sundays. This painting, displayed nearby, shows an unusual crucifixion scene, perhaps reflecting Wallace's awareness of his own mortality as he neared the end of his life. Thank you for joining us on this tour of Alfred Wallace Rediscovered. To find out more about the exhibition, visit kettlesyard.co.uk forward slash Alfred Wallace at home.